if we could all be parents for a minute and think of having um, like a little kid, young child, if you don't already, and um, but you know, we'll kind of like don't think of your own kid. This is like just make this impersonal because who knows what's going to happen to them, okay? So like, but just you, you're you're like you're a parent or you're somebody that can see things with a higher like a bigger perspective and let's say more time, more experience, and then uh, you know you you have this child, this young child, and um, there they are, and they've got that baby child look on their face, which is, um, you know, I was just uh, hearing Swami Kriyananda talk, uh, talk about this, and he was saying, you know, what, what is it that makes babies look like babies? Like, whether, you know, they could be um, you know, like a baby dog or a baby cat or a baby person or a baby horse or a, a baby cow or a baby elephant. They all have this trust or this um, sweetness or, um, you know what it is? It's like they're open-hearted, right? So you can see that in their faces, right? The, the young, the really young that we've experienced. And then... Um, and so there you are, you're like this caregiver, let's say, or who knows. And you've got this, this, this being that has all this open-hearted love and like the, the world is like interesting. So like the grass is interesting and the, the sky is interesting and noises are interesting and the most, the most plain mundane things, they're actually interesting and to this this being, and um, and so this being wants to go out and experience everything, right? I remember when my son was little, and I could I could just see this in him, you know, and you know I've only had one child, and so this is my one, you know, time, and I remember like um, sticking him up in a tree so he could touch it, and you know, like holding him over the flowers that so he could like feel him and smell him and like whatever I saw him looking at, I made it my job to get him there, you know, so because he was little, right? And just kind of like, I remember like, like a microphone, like sticking him into stuff everywhere. And um, we had so much fun. But you know, and the, but as, as things go, so like as that little being wants more and more and more to experience the world around it, um, you know, the reality is, is that it, it's, it wants everything, even like it wants to dive into the rose bush, right? But the rose bush is going to poke it and, and hurt it and make it cry. And it wants to touch the flame on the stove, but the flame's going to burn them. Unfortunately, this is the world we live in. I didn't create it, okay? But so we want to, let's say we want to take them somewhere where they can, they can, experience their independence where they can develop their motor skills and their social skills and so maybe we take them to like a little park with other little kids and so they go to the park and there they are all these little beings all these little points of awareness and consciousness and they're all sweet and they all want the same kind of thing and they go to the park and they play and at first they're like so excited it's the most thrilling experience ever to go to the park and um, to be on the swing or the merry-go-round for the first time, to meet other children, to be in a new environment. So what they're doing is, is they're expanding their awareness and they're living, right? But then they go down the slide and they fall. And they go on the merry-go-round and, and the big kids come and then all of a sudden the merry-go-round won't stop and they want to get off, right? And so mommy wants to run over there. I mean, you need to, right? Before your little infant flies off and ends up in a puddle, you need to like go get them like, and protect them, right, from all the other kids. And, and you only want what's good for them. You never intended for them to get a bruise on the slide and end up with a mouthful of dirt. I remember, um, okay, so my poor son, I'm glad he doesn't come to these things. So like, he was really little, we got him this little bike, and we had the most, hardly even a hill in front of our house. And um, 
you know, he was starting to push around on it a little bit. He, was, he had training wheels and he was starting to pedal it. And he was having so much fun. And I thought, you know, he's going to bonk his head. It's, this is not going to be good, right? Because he felt so invincible. So I thought, okay, you know, I took him to the store. I said, you know, and I'm thinking as an adult, like, he's not going to want to wear a helmet, right? And, um, but of course, he thought helmets were cool because he's a little kid. He wasn't jaded yet, right? That, that came in about 15 minutes. But like, he was still ignorant and he still had his heart open to it. He thought everything was going to be perfect. And he just could, he picked out his helmet. Because I remember me and, and his mom, we were like, how are we going to get him to wear that helmet? And we're like, yeah, maybe he's going to think it's cool. I don't know. And so he thought the helmet was so cool, but we didn't understand what he thought. So he put stickers all over it and he put it on, we strapped it on his chin. And what he, I didn't know this, okay? But he thought that helmet was making him invincible. I told him it was to protect you, but he didn't know. He thought he had like superpowers, right? So instead of being all of a sudden, I, I had no idea what was going to happen because he had been pedaling this bike around totally safe, stuck the helmet on his head, and he says, Daddy, can I go over there? And I said, Sure, you can go over there. So now he's out of my reach. He turns around and he starts going down that hill as fast as he can. And I'm like, and so I'm like, hey, slow down. He's like, I got my helmet. I'm, I'm good. So he goes as fast as he can. He can't even keep up. He starts getting all this momentum. And he was not going that fast, but for a little kid, he was going fast. He loses control of his bike. He goes over the handlebars. And luckily, he lands on his mouth in the, in the grass instead of the cement. And he gets this huge mouthful of dirt. He's crying his head off. He tears the helmet off his head. This is, this is how you know he's my son. This is, this is, he's like got my blood. He says, stupid helmet. <laughs> Never, like, that, that whole helmet thing lasted. It was, it was helmet bliss for about 10 minutes. He got that big mouth of dirt. He's like, it doesn't work, Dad. And he like never wanted to wear it again, okay? And so from his point of view, at that moment, life was unfair. Life was cruel, right? Because he, he had his heart open to it. He didn't, he didn't have any bad intentions. And he got a mouthful of dirt. And he was bummed at his bike. He was scared to ride it after that. He thought that the helmet had absolutely no purpose. So why would you ever wear it? It didn't save me. Um, and so he was very confused. Now, as a parent, I want to give him the experiences that he needs to grow and not be afraid. But at the same time, he has to learn life's lessons. And so to learn to respect that you can get hurt and, and nothing is going to make you invincible, right? And so then you go, who knows what the next thing is. And so but what the idea of like this playground that we're all on as children, we're here to learn stuff. And when, when the lessons come, like, like, like my son, it's actually a pretty good example, is that uh, from his perspective, it feels absolutely unfair, it feels absolutely cruel, and at the moment, life feels hopeless. I mean, it just feels like, why should I do anything if that's how this is going to end up, if that's what this world is going to do to me. Okay. So we've all lived through that and we've seen it enough in our own lives to know that that, that example is relatively true. Okay. Now the weird thing is because like, like my son even, so, um, you know, then the next thing, like it's the next sport or whatever it might be, or it might be when you're older and, and you know, he's a boy. And so you're like, Maybe when you're way older and it's like stuff happening in school and class at first school's fun, then it's scary. Or uh, meeting girls or dealing with peers in our wonderful school system. Okay. And so the lessons keep coming. And, the, you know, the topic was uh, why do this is what we put on the internet. I don't know. I never know who sees these things or if they just come. Um, the topic for tonight was why bad things happen to good people. Because um, this used to drive me crazy in my own life. I, I actually didn't consider myself a very good person, but I knew people who had really pure intentions. 
that were less selfish and crazy than I was. And I saw bad things happening to them. Health problems, car accidents. And I, and I didn't have any spiritual perspective, you know, and I was like, God, of all people, why did it have to, have to happen to that person? Um, what are they getting out of it? They feel totally confused and everything. But the thing is, so I, I, could, I could like make this like a real talk, I suppose, if I was a real teacher, which I'm not. And I could dig up all the scriptural stuff, and this saint said that, and that saint said this. But I'll just give it to you from my own point of view. But it's, it, I'm not the only one that feels this way. That life is a school. Life is a playground and a school. It's the same thing. And it has a purpose, and we come here to learn. And we come here to learn who we are. And eventually we come here to learn, because in what drives us, we want to be happy. And we want freedom. Like we want to be able to ride the bike as fast as we can and feel like we're just free. Everybody wants to be free. So adrenaline people are like using hang gliders, you know, um, people who aren't so adrenaline oriented and more virtual may, may get their flying experience with the drone. You know, or it might be a social thing like in your knitting and crochet group or with your team or with your hobbies or all these things that we get involved with. And we're always looking for happiness. We're looking for fulfillment. We're looking for a sense of purpose. Why are we here? And um, the reason that bad things happen to good people is because It's because there's some lesson in there that whatever it was or whatever it is, it doesn't even have to be, a sp like let's say, um, you know, like, like my son fell and he ended up with a mouthful of dirt. So he's, it's not like, you can't get all mental about it, like, oh, don't eat dirt, you know. Or it might be, sure, be a little more careful when you're riding your bike. But at the end of the day, when those things happen, so again, remember the idea, the image of the way children, young babies look in their faces, that sweetness and that wide-eyed wonder that they have. And then when you look at adults, it's gone. It's totally gone. Even like when I'm talking about them, like adults, you can see the fear, the worry, the concern, like where's this going? I don't trust anybody. What's the agenda? How much longer is this gonna last? I mean, as adults, we get pretty cynical, right? Okay. And so for my son, it's like, okay, be careful with your bike when you're three years old. But for us, what does it mean when, um, I don't know, our, our loved ones betray us, uh, we did everything we could to be really great at the job, and we got fired, and then the biggest backstabber, liar, cheater of the whole group got your promotion, it happens all the time, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many knives are in my own back. Okay? So I know. I know from personal experience. They're still in there. Um, and I feel them. Okay, I feel them. Therefore, I am not free. So if, if we, want, we, we want happiness, we want freedom, and we also want purpose, maybe, what we're learning is, beyond all the little specific things, is that, okay, so now this is where it gets more into like where the different religions and spiritual traditions all pretty much say the same thing. You'll never find what you want in this world. And you won't, I know it sounds bummer, you know, but you won't even find it in the people that you love and the people that love you. You'll never get it. You'll never, it will never last. It'll never be that good. It'll never, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. This is where Darshan has said, don't make it depressing. There is nothing. There is absolutely no hope. What Yogananda says, it's getting better, trust me. There is no freaking hope. This world is crazy and it's a setup. It's a total setup and it's designed to teach us how to, like, like a little kid, how to, how to use your body, how to use your will, 
how to use your brain to the best way you can, but it's also designed so that so they teach you like how to have a healthy ego and say no to mommy and daddy. You get that's a stage that we go through, like being younger and then a teenage level and all these different things. But the other thing that happens through all that suffering and all that loss is we develop compassion for others. And we start to there's a point where the suffering isn't just about us anymore. It even gets worse because we can see it in other people. So you look around and you're like, okay, not only am I getting a beat down, but the people I love in some way, maybe even feeling like they're being tortured at one point in their life, or, or it might be the slow death of just normal inward silent stress and anxiety and high blood pressure and a, just a general sense of living for when your alarm clock tells you it's time to go to work and making your damn coffee and, and just kind of like driving to work and the grind on the freeway. But there's something missing, right? And the, the, the answer is, because I know everything. Um, I'm just like you, right? But I'm just, I'm in this stupid role. Okay. The answer is that you won't find any of what we really want outside of yourself. And so at a certain point, we start exploring Tai Chi, yoga, we do therapy, we end up getting into something like meditation. And a lot of times, we might even feel like we're almost like a weakling because we have to meditate when everyone else can go to happy hour. And ha ha ha, everything's so great. Okay. But, um, you know, it's like I have a Friday philosophy class where I do these kinds of depressing talks, and there's a few lost souls that come, and everyone else is at the Cheesecake Factory or the Red Onion or whatever they're doing, right? Okay, or they're, they're consuming, they're at Best Buy. I don't know. Okay. But the good news is, is that as... The, the bad news is, as long as we look outside of ourselves for fulfillment, it won't work. It just won't last. Um, but if we can find that inner relationship, that inner fulfillment, um, then things change. They really change. Um, because then, when if you can learn, if you don't already know how, maybe everyone, I don't know where you are, I don't know what you can do, but where it doesn't have to be classical meditation like what we teach. It might be having a moment in nature. It might be floating around in the ocean on a boat or a surfboard, or it might be being in the mountains. Those are outward things. But if they help us open our heart, and if we can internalize that experience and realize that the sweetness that we feel, the appreciation that we have, it's not all about, I have this thing with the ocean, and nature. It's not all about the ocean. It's not all about the beautiful forest. It's something inside. And those things, like the, the moon at night or the sunset, remind us. Like uh, they, t they cause us to pause and they remind us, they help us to feel the sweetness that's already inside. The delusion is, is that we need the outside stuff. So with meditation, we can learn to direct our awareness inside, to actually kind of close our, our senses to all that stimulus, and we can learn to experience the sweetness of inner peace, true mental clarity, but also spiritual upliftment, and we can actually discover our purpose in this inner life of, let's say, daily meditation, just creating a little time maybe 10 minutes a day if you don't already do it, or maybe a lot more if you're totally into it. But learning to go inside um, without the need of anyone else's support and without the need of perfect circumstances and actually just to be able to close your eyes. And one way is to feel the breath and use the concentration of the breath to kind of draw you inward away from your senses and away from your outer consciousness deeper and deeper and deeper until your experience of going within actually uh, it takes time, but it can become very blissful, very sweet, very fulfilling. And not only that, but you actually can get answers there. 
And um, the, the, the biggest burdens that trouble us, that we're worried about, the things that are hardest to accept and face, the answers can just kind of be revealed because they're in you somewhere. And it's not like meditation's magic, but basically it's helping you have a deeper kind of mental clarity in the quiet. Without all the activity, your body heals, your mind heals, your heart relaxes, your breathing gets calmer, everything, everything just gets smoother. And then you open your eyes and you come out of meditation and you're in the same playground where all the crazy things can happen, but you don't lose the, the memory or even the feeling of that inner experience, that inner truth. It doesn't matter if you believe in God. Um, it's a good place in meditation to pray. It's a good place to try to get your answers if you believe in God. I believe in God. Um, but I didn't before I started meditating. I got that through meditation. But um, whatever you believe in doesn't even matter. Think of meditation. Yogananda, my teacher over there, Yogananda said that meditation was the laboratory for your religion, to test your religious or spiritual beliefs directly through personal experience of meditation. And that's what caught my eye, kind of caught me when I started meditating. Because I wanted answers, I was sick of suffering, and I was sick of watching other people suffer. And I, I was looking at the world back in around then, and uh, I, I thought it was just hopeless. I really did. And now I look at it, and I, it looks worse. You know? But the, but the thing is, on the outside, it looks worse. But um, when we had 9-11, um, I was a yoga teacher at the time. Um, people came to my class that morning crying because their, their family in New York and different things are going on, and we're all hearing the news. And what I saw after that was that even though there was all this hate energy and all these things that happened, but internally a lot of people spiritualized. A lot of people were like, wow, life is temporary. Um, anything can happen. We're not so safe after all. You know, we're so isolated in the United States from all the reality that's happening out there. And uh, people weren't feeling isolated anymore. They were feeling vulnerable. Vulnerable is good because it makes you grow. So why do bad things happen to good people? Because it's time. It's time for us, when, when these tests come, when you're faced with big challenges, you have hard times, you don't have the answers, everyone that loves you thinks you're blowing it and you're screwing up. Life is just telling you it's time to do something different. And if you're in this room, I believe that what life is telling you is to develop or deepen, if you already have it, your inner life develop your spiritual life and explore ways and we can help those who are interested to open your heart and live more like the baby that has that innocence and that trust and that uh, it seems like ignorance but there's actually something very wise about moving through life with an open heart and being able to see all the hard things that are happening even to us and the people that we love. But um, in time, you will be able to navigate it. It's not just meditation. It comes through life experience and deepening your relationship with spirit. Because in time, what you'll see, um, if, you can, if you can not give up and learn to move back and observe your breath, let's say, without controlling it, Observe your thoughts from another place and realize that those thoughts are not you. Then life becomes a little bit more interesting. And then when you look at people and people are saying and doing crazy things, even if they're bad, you may be able to connect inside that they're they're maybe maybe not feeling that inner thing that you have that you're developing. And you, instead of judging them, instead of being afraid of them, instead of being angry with them, no matter how bad they might seem, you will begin to feel love and compassion and acceptance for them. And you won't need to change them. 
and you'll know that you can't because it's hard enough just to change ourselves. And the people that do the creepiest things in this world, they suffer. That's why they're doing it. And they're, ju they're no different than you and me. They actually mean well. The perpetrators of the worst crimes have some weird thing in their head that they think at the time that they did it, it was what needed to happen. They all do. And so something that my teacher, this guy, Swami Kriyananda, um, said over and over and over when we couldn't accept the behavior of others or ourselves, he said, everybody's doing the best they can. And we're all doing the best that we can right now. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. We're all learning our lessons. And so I hope that's not totally depressing. There is a reason that there's so much suffering. There is a reason that this world is so crazy. And the reason is that, that this world is not our home. Our home is in a way better place and it's inside. And when we learn to access it, I'll just say it as a truth, but you can think what you want. You know, that's okay. I'm open to that. But when you learn to access this inner peace, inner kingdom thing, in time, um, what you'll realize or you'll experience is that you're able to go there whenever you need to, with a body or without one, with good conditions or without, with the other people's support or not. It's always there. It's eternal. And eventually, um, the goal of life at the higher level, according to the yoga and Christianity or Jesus or whoever you want to talk to, Buddha, Krishna, is to be free from suffering and free from the delusion that we're separate from the divine kingdom, let's say, our divine birthright, in true peace, true freedom, true awareness. And everything else is just temporary. 